Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand as the academic procession will enter the room. Please be seated. Good evening, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. A particular word of welcome to our rector, Professor Wim de Villiers. Um, is the, the microphone on? It sounds, it sounds right. Yeah, thank you for availing time to attend the inaugural tonight. We really do appreciate it. And also a really special word of welcome to Professor Duval's parents uh, sitting there <coughs> at the left back, your left back. We're really privileged to, to welcome you here at the occasion, at the event as well. Uh, a long way to travel and uh, it's certainly worthwhile and a very special, you know, to have you here. Um, I would then also like to introduce um, Professor Duval very shortly so for his um, inaugural lecture. Um, when I scan through his um, biography, the first thing you know, that caught my eye that he came from you know, a family that is in the teaching profession you know, as well. So I think there was uh, good foundations to start off with. And working on wine today, being from France, I think that was a, a double layer, um, you know, laying excellent foundations, you know, for what today is a successful, you know, career in science, education, uh, around, you know, the theme and the topic, you know, of wine. It was also no coincidence, uh, his arrival here in 2005 as a young, inexperienced uh, postdoctoral fellow. Professor Duval said it was actually the first time really traveling, you know, outside you know, of, you know, of France, you know, from in his professional era. And he thought he would have been here for a year or two. And now I think it's nearly 20 years later. And uh, we now really have something to celebrate. It was also interesting to observe how you've actually worked your way through, you know, all the academic sort of phases of your career, um, starting off, you know, with a postdoc. Um, and it should really act as an encouragement you know, to everyone here, particularly the, our younger colleagues. Um, I think it is um, a real good example that you've um, set, you know, for everyone to follow. Um, also some that I think really deserves mention um, is your strong suit of research, you know, outputs. Um, it's easy to quote just the seven, 70 peer-reviewed, you know, papers, but it extends far beyond that. Also, a strong cohort of postgraduate students, um, over 25 masters and 11 PhD students. I saw when you were taking the pictures also nice to see the current cohort of students under your supervision surrounding you there for the picture and isn't that what it is actually all about um, then um, i think also something that deserves special mention um, and i think that is probably shows a lot more about who he is as a person as who you are as a scientist um, is the acknowledgement of your own home country of france who awarded um, the Order of Agricultural Merit, you know, to yourself uh, in, in 2020 uh, during the COVID phase. And that was actually for the contribution that you made in strengthening the scientific and cultural ties between South Africa and France. Uh, you've really made a huge effort to build those networks uh, on which a lot of other students and colleagues, you know, have benefited from and certainly our university as well, and that deserves a you know, special acknowledgement. 
And the last little bit um, that tells something about yourself, what you like and what you don't like. I must say, I've skipped one thing is you, you've made mention that you also acted as head of the department. Um, and we work closely together, myself as the dean of the faculty with, with uh, Professor Duval then as head of the department. And I come to learn that he takes nothing for granted. But on the flip side, he also doesn't take no for an answer. <laughs> So uh, that was something that I still remember of, of working with you in that capacity. And then just your, your own personal interest in private space, uh, it really just um, underpins you as a person with a creative mind and spirit. Uh, so well done, and we really look forward to your inaugural lecture. That is a beautiful culmination of not only your arrival here in South Africa, but your contribution. And we look forward not only to the lecture, but for you also the rest of your academic career. So, but for now, uh, you're welcome to join in front and prepare for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Brink, for this very kind introduction. Um, I'm very actually moved to see all of you here, um, and including all of my colleagues, uh, my parents obviously, uh, former students. It's very important for me. I thought it was a good opportunity to create some kind of reunion. So thank you very much for responding to my invitation. Um, it, it really means a lot to me. So thank you. Thank, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself um, for those who might not know me that well. Um, and then obviously much more about uh, my research. Um, let me start with who I am. So as Professor Brink uh, mentioned, obviously I am from France. I was born in Paris, uh, somewhere in the southeast of Paris, somewhere there. Um, and I grew up not so far from there, about 20 kilometers uh, southeast of Paris, um, in a town that was called Raveil. Uh, and this was uh, interesting because this town uh, was known in the 19th century to be the home of three artists, um, very famous in France and I think uh, also internationally. So, a writer, a painter, you may, you may know this uh, famous painting, Liberty Leading the People. Um, and also one of the very first uh, photographers. Um, and then I finished high school actually over there in 1994. And I must say my parents, I'm sure, uh, remember this time. I had absolutely no clue what to do for a career. Um, and so now I tell the young students, you know, don't worry. Um, it will all be fine in the end. So um, the only thing I really knew was that I liked biology. So I started to study biology in Paris. And two years later, the beginning of the adventure, I moved south, uh, southwest in France into the city of Bordeaux uh, to study agricultural sciences. Um, and in parallel, for some very odd reason, uh, I thought wine was something interesting. Um, and so I studied uh, in parallel, I studied enology, and I got this degree from the, universi from the University of Bordeaux. And then I was still young at that time and decided, okay, I'm just going to push it a little bit further um, and still stay in the wine area, um, but kind of combining what I started from with uh, biology. So I combined the two and <coughs> became wine microbiology. And so I, I, I did my master's um, on the alginine transport in Inococcus ini. So it's a wine bacterium, one of the main wine bacteria. And then I moved for my PhD. At that time, I must say, during my master's, that's where I really had an epiphany. And from there on, I really, really knew what I wanted to do because I really discovered a passion for, for research and for research in wine microbiology in particular. And then, as Professor Brank said, I um, came down here to South Africa uh, in this beautiful building of ours where we are today, um, first as a postdoc, and then I just uh, carried on until today. So I actually, although I am French, I have never actually worked in France, so I've always I've done all my <laughs> career in South Africa. <laughs> So you may ask then, why, why wine? Why microbiology? 
Um, it's actually a little bit of a philosophical question. Uh, the easy answer would be I'm not quite sure. Uh, you could look at it from a philosophical way. Uh, there's a famous French writer who said, uh, wine has the power to fill in the soul with all truth, knowledge, and philosophy. So it's actually quite a nice uh, quotation. Um, but uh, one thing that really struck me from the start was something that is close to my heart, a few things that are close to my heart, that the fact that wine is, uh, is connected to a very long history, and I really like history, culture, art, and socialization. These are things that are really important for me. And then, why microbiology? Um, well, I think it's just because for me it's really fascinating. It, it's incredibly complex and diverse. And then, very pragmatically, as, um, and I know she's listening, and so I'm not sure if she will remember, but as my PhD supervisor told me one day, it's much nicer than studying the microbiology of pig manure, uh, with all due respect to people studying pig manure. I'm not going to tell you the circumstances of this quotation, but I can tell you later. So, okay, so like I said, I like history, so let's start there, where it actually all started. Um, so, wine actually started, all the history of wine making dates back about 10,000 years ago, and we believe it started somewhere in Anatolia, which is in two days, um, in, in uh, current days, uh, Turkey. Uh, it moved um, east initially, a little bit north, south uh, to what was then Persia, which is now Iran, um, Syria. Uh, then Palestine, Egypt, and then through all the history of conquest, invasions, and colonization, it moved to Greece, eventually to Italy, France, Spain, and then it moved up north to, uh, to Germany. So we're almost in our era now, uh, but you can see it took quite some time, uh, about 8,000 years ago, to get there. Eventually it moved to the rest of the world, um, as, as you know. So we've got about 10,000 years of winemaking history. Um, and obviously you can imagine if people got so interested in wine for so long, obviously enology is also a very old science. And we have records of scientific uh, studies that date back all the way to about 200 BC. Um, what's interesting here is that people talked about the culture of grapevine and they talked, as you can see, they talked about the art of winemaking. And I think one of the reasons why that, because they were not quite sure what was happening, it was a bit of a mystery how grape juice became wine. Uh, no one really knew uh, what was going on during the so-called fermentation. So it was only at the end of the 18th century where chemists actually at the time started to study this fermentation and they initially saw it as a chemical reaction. And that's the beginning of real science as we know it today. Uh, where we have glucose and fructose, the sugars in the grape juice that, that are converted to alcohol in the form of ethanol and obviously carbon dioxide. But then, uh, because of some financial crisis, uh, the famous scientist uh, Pasteur was asked to look into this a little bit further and what he found out was that it was actually not a chemical reaction and he used a very, very modern tool at that time which was a microscope. And at this time, it looked something like that. They look very different today, but they do the same function. They perform the same function. And Pasteur looked into the microscope at grape juice and wine, and actually, I'm going to show you what he drew as wine, and what did he see? He saw something like this. And he said, okay, so there are things moving and living in the wine, and he called them microscopic organized beings. Um, and he went a little bit further and isolated some of them as actually responsible for alcoholic fermentation, so for converting grape juice to wine in a good way, and he put all the other ones in a second category, which was spoilage. So those that he identified, he called them the ferments. Later on, they became yeast, and a little bit later on, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then he went a little bit further as well. He said alcoholic fermentation is actually something that this ferments or yeast perform without oxygen. And that was interesting. He called it la vie sans air in French, which means life without air or obviously oxygen. 
So I'm going back to this equation of uh, sugars converted to, to alcohol and carbon dioxide. And if I take an example, if you follow this equation from 230 gram per liter of sugars, you get about 14.9% ethanol. But this is actually not true because you actually get 13.4. So why? What's going on? Well, it's because this equation is actually not really true. And there are many other compounds that are produced from uh, the breakdown of sugars, among which a lot of aroma compounds. And this, this is what wine uh, is all about. Okay, so we have about 10,000 years of experience in winemaking. We have about 250 years of scientific investigation into fermentation. So obviously, surely by now we know how to make wine, hopefully good wine. Uh, we have solved most winemaking problems. We understand fermentation at an unprecedented level. So you may ask, what am I doing here? Why are we still doing research in wine microbiology? And I think a simple answer is because it's really, really fascinating. It's also constantly evolving. It's incredibly complex and diverse. And my research is actually all about exploring wine yeast diversity. And I could break it down into two subsections. The first one is about what we call wine yeast physiology. So it's basically what yeast do. Uh, the nutrients that they need to, to live, what they do with these nutrients, so how well they perform, uh, they, they ferment, and what kind of aromas and flavors they produce. The second one is what we would call wine yeast cell wall biochemistry and enzymology. And over there, I mostly focus on enzymes and their impact on wine properties. OK, so I'm not going to tell you everything I've done in the past 20 years. So I've just picked and chose a few. Uh, but let's start with the first one, so the wine yeast physiology. So this is basically about what they take up and what happens inside the cell. So what do they need? Well, they're a little bit like us in a way. Uh, they need a carbon source in the form of sugars. They need a nitrogen source. Um, so obviously they cannot eat this kind of thing, so they need simpler molecules. So they mostly need ammonium and amino acids. They also need some minerals in the form of ions, and they need some fats, uh, call them lipids. So they need fatty acids and sterols. And finally, like us, they need vitamins. But yeast are a little bit original because they mostly actually need the B vitamins. They don't really need the other vitamins. Um, and then, so what happens during this fermentation? Well, they actually consume the sugars, and in the meantime, the alcohol increases. What's very interesting and very original about wine fermentation is that they also grow, which means they produce more yeast. And this is actually the main goal of the yeast. They, they're not really interested in making great wine. They, they're just here to live and to make new yeast. And this is what they do here. So their population grows. But what's very interesting about wine fermentation is that at some point, they run out of nitrogen. And there, they cannot grow any further. And there's still a lot of sugars left. But they will stop growing and they will just stay in what we call this stationary phase until the end of fermentation, just consuming the sugars, producing compounds, but they are not growing their population any longer. And what's also interesting is that I mentioned Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but there are actually many other yeasts. Uh, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and then you've just, I just uh, put here a few examples. And there are many, many more of those. And you see the exotic names. You can try to pronounce them. Good luck. Um, and they were all categorized almost since the Pasteur time as non-saccharomyces yeast, just because they were not saccharomyces cerevisiae. Some people call them non-conventional yeast. I don't really like this expression personally, but you see that in literature. And they're actually interesting. Initially, they were all put in the category of spoilage yeast. In the past 20, 30 years, we started to reconsider uh, this, this statement. And we actually found that a lot of them actually can contribute positively. 
And you can see here uh, a few examples of what they can do. They can produce interesting aromas in the form of esters, um, glycerol production, um, aroma con contributing to aroma complexity, releasing varietal aroma compounds, and so on and so on and so on. But they all behave differently. And this is where it becomes really interesting, at least from my side. Um, you can see here the same that we said earlier about Saccharomyces cerevisiae over here. But you also have the other ones that we are interested in at the moment. And you can see, yes, they cannot perform fermentation to the end. There's still some sugars left, but they ferment in all in different ways. Some of them ferment better than others. You can see here examples of those that ferment pretty well. And over there, those that ferment not so well. Uh, and one that is totally original, uh, which almost goes nowhere slowly at its own rhythm. Uh, but eventually, it, it does ferment. It takes forever, but it does ferment. And they all produce different aromas and flavors. This is also what makes them interesting from a winemaking perspective. And you just see some examples. Uh, we measured here some uh, higher alcohols, which is part of the flavor compounds. And you can see the, the, the size of the bars are all different. So they all produce different uh, quantities of these compounds. The question is, why? This is what I'm interested in. And also, how? And you can see here, for instance, I just pick an example. You can see that this yeast called Mechnikovia pulcherima, it produces twice the amount of phenylethanol as the other yeast, and yet it consumed the least phenylalanine, which is the substrate for phenylethanol. Well, that's very intriguing. OK, so in a simplified way, this is what happens in the yeast, and this is how they consume the sugars and what they do with these sugars. So you can see here the sugars on top, and it goes down through something, a pathway called glycolysis. Some of you might remember this. And then it, they produce ethanol from this. What's very interesting about this is that the reason for the yeast to produce ethanol is because they are forced to. And this is, I'm going back to life without oxygen. Because they have no oxygen, they need to produce ethanol. And the reason for this is what's written in red a little bit everywhere, what we call redox cofactors. And these cofactors facilitate reactions of oxidation and reactions and, and reductions. So if the reaction is an oxidation, there's a reduction on the NAD, on the redox cofactor side. But because they have a limited pool of these redox cofactors, somewhere else they need to be recycled. And usually, it uses oxygen. But because there's no oxygen, they found an alternative way. And this is the production of ethanol. If you follow the same logic, they start producing interesting compounds, or not so interesting compounds, depending on how you see them. Glycerol, succinic acid, lipids, acetate, and so on and so forth. And on that side, a little bit separate, but there is a connection, as you can see here, between sugars and over there. You have the production of some of the main aroma compounds produced by the yeast. High alcohols, esters, volatile fatty acids. They mostly come, or we thought, they mostly came from amino acids, but there is a connection, and they can also come from sugars. These pathways have been very well known since about the 1940s. And they are very conserved. So if you take one species, another species, another species, they, these pathways are mostly conserved. But not always. And some of them can, some of the yeast species can produce interesting compounds that our reference yeast Saccharomyces does not produce. An example of this is interesting polyols. Sorbitol, you may know sorbitol, arabitol, mannitol. These are used in the food industry as sweeteners. Um, and they are produced by yeast called Torellaspora delbrueckii. Saccharomyces cerevisiae only produces traces of it. Another example of it here is the production of lactic acid by La Chancea thermotolerance, which is very interesting. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae produces also none or traces of it. And even if we just consider these pathways that I mentioned before, 
they all produce different amounts of the different compounds. And here we compared different strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and you can see again the size of the bars, they all produce different uh, quantities of these compounds. I want to take you through a little journey about one in particular that's interesting. And this is, I mentioned it before, this phenyl ethanol, phenyl ethyl acetate, which smells like rose, by the way. So they're quite interesting aroma compounds. And you can see we found out a yeast, Cleveromyces moxianus, that if you look at the light blue bars, that produces much more than Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we thought, okay, that is very interesting, that especially from a wine point of view. So let's try to understand why. So we compared Saccharomyces cerevisiae with Cleveromyces moxianus. Okay, so this is the pathway leading to the production of these compounds. As I mentioned before, they come from phenylalanine, but because nothing is simple, they can also come from sugars. What did we do? We used an isotope of phenylalanine, which is a heavy version of the molecule, which is over there. And this allows us to track it and to see when it gets broken down, where it goes in the metabolism. And we found something very interesting. We found that Saccharomyces cerevisiae channels 80% of the phenylalanine it takes up to proteins. But if you look at Cleveromyces moxianus, only 32%. Over there, it's the opposite. From phenylparavate to phenylethanol, it's 14% in Saccharomyces cerevisiae against 65% in Cleveromyces moxianus. What does that tell us? It tells us that the fluxes are different. For Saccharomyces cerevisiae, most of the phenylalanine goes that way and most of the phenyl ethanol produced actually comes from sugars. But with, with Cleveromyces moxianus, it mostly comes from phenylalanine. So that was really interesting, at least from my side. Um, so we said, okay, but then why? Why is this happening? Why is this different between the two yeast? And a few years later, we actually found out that phenylalanine is toxic for Cleuromyces moxianus. You can see here, when you increase the concentration of phenylalanine, fermentation performance decreases. And this was linked, I'm not showing it here, but this was linked to a loss of viability. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae, in comparison, is mostly unaffected. So for, for Cleuromyces moxianus, it is toxic. And we think that this is the reason why it produces so much phenylethyl acetate, because it tries to detoxify it sells. Let us go back to this complicated pathways of sugar because we thought there's definitely something. It, it's really interesting, this story about fluxes and so on. Um, something very interesting that we thought was known for a very long time is this story I mentioned, these redox factors. And I learned when I was a student and until very recently, I thought, because I taught that as well, that these redox cofactors over time are very stable. And very recently, we found that this is actually not true. We selected a few time points during fermentation, and we quantified these redox cofactors. And this is something that's usually not done. People just consider it as something known. No one gets really interested in this. What we found out is that these cofactors are stable, but only at the very beginning. And then they start to drop drastically. And even the ratios between these two forms that I mentioned, NAD plus, NAD H, it's also not stable. And the devil's in the detail. You have four different strains here. And you see that, yes, the global pattern is, confer is conserved, but there are differences between strains. And this could explain why this yeast produced different compounds and different amounts of these compounds because this mirrors differences in the production of aroma compounds. So I said, okay, but then what about the other species? Well, globally, it's the same. But again, there are many differences between species. And something that caught our attention in this graph is over there. 
because you can see that the blue bar is very, very, very tiny over here. So this yeast, which are actually the poor fermenters that I showed you a few slides back, their NAD plus is almost depleted very, very quickly. And we think maybe there's a reason here, there's a connection between this very low NAD and their fermentation performance. But this will need to be further investigated. So this is basically where we are now. And what I'm going to get interested in the future is to keep investigating this unique features of certain yeast, like the production of polyols and lactic acid that I mentioned, also the conditions governing the production of these compounds, and then also the role of certain vitamins that have been very poorly investigated so far. And I'm talking about things like vitamins, lipids, and also oxygen to a certain extent. Okay, so let me switch gear and move on to the other aspect of my research program, which is looking at this kind of things. And no, it is not a monster. No, it is not a crab. Um, it's actually an enzyme. So let's try and, and, and look into this. So, so far, what I've been talking about is what happens inside the cell. Now I'm going to tell you what happens just on the edge of the cell. So you can see here the membrane and then the cell wall. And there are lots of proteins over here. And some of them are enzymes. And these enzymes can be of great enological interest, so of interest for winemaking. You can see here a few potential benefits. And this is all about um, helping some technological issues, so clarification of wine, facilitating this clarification, um, solving the problem of what we call protein haze, um, but also liberating some interesting compounds, flavor compounds, um, like uh, terpenes, uh, for instance. And as you can see from the list of publication, that kept me busy for a number of years. So I've picked two. I'm not going to tell you all of them. I've picked two of them. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about pectinase, and then I'll tell you something about uh, proteases. So pectinases is an interesting activity because they help us get from uh, grape juice after pressing that looks very murky, something like this, into something that's clear, that we can ferment without getting herbaceous uh, compounds uh, during fermentation. So we want to get something like this. And these enzymes facilitate this process by breaking down a molecule that is from the grapes, which is called pectin. So in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we knew that there is a gene called PGU1. It stands for polygalactronase. Polygalactronase is one form of pectinases. So we knew there's a gene in Saccharomyces cerevisiae that encodes for this enzyme. But most wine strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae do not show any pectinase activity. So the first question was, why? And this very simple question kept us busy for about 10 years. So we started looking into a few strains. And we said in, in some of them, we couldn't find the gene. So OK, problem solved. They cannot, they don't have any pectinase activity just because they don't have the gene. And it's because this gene was replaced by some mobile genetic elements. So the gene is gone, no activity, problem solved. OK, but what about the other strains that possess the gene but still do not show any activity? We looked at the gene sequence, only minor mutations, nothing very interesting. All the genes are functional, theoretically. And at some point, we found out that this gene is located in a region of a chromosome, of chromosome 10 of the yeast, which is called a telomere. So this is the regions at the very end of the chromosome. And typically, it is known today that the genes located in the vicinity of the very end of the chromosomes are repressed. So, OK, so that sounds like uh, an interesting avenue to explore. Um, so we said, OK, so let's took the gene and let's move it to another location. So we took out the gene from chromosome 10 from the telomere, and we moved it somewhere on chromosome 5, far away from the telomeres. And ta-da, 
you have a yeast year with no activity and when we move the gene, so we took its own gene, we just moved it at a different location and you can see here this halo shows a massive pectinase activity. And even in a strain that's not so clear here, but maybe, but even in a strain that did show activity, it showed a higher activity. So that was really uh, interesting. But it's interesting from a biological point of view, from a fundamental point of view, but from a winemaking point of view, it doesn't really help solve the problem because this new yeast where the gene has been moved is a genetically or uh, modified yeast and we're not allowed to use it in the wine industry. So, okay, so we said let's look at other yeast because this is what we do. So we looked at a close uh, parent of a close cousin of Saccharomyces cerevisiae which is Saccharomyces paradoxus. Interestingly this yeast all have activity. You can see this is a Saccharomyces cerevisiae, no activity. These are Saccharomyces paradoxus strains, they have activity. But it doesn't help, actually. If you look here, one other thing about clarification and enhanced clarification is that you get also a higher yield of grape juice, which is very interesting for the wine industry. And when we looked at this yield of free-run juice or free-run wine with paradoxes, it didn't really help significantly. Only when the gene was overexpressed did it help. But again, we can't use this yeast. Okay, so last phase, let's move on again and let's look a little bit further. We look to a close cousin, let's, let's look at distant cousins. And very recently, we again, I mentioned that yeast earlier about this rose flavor production, but what's interesting about it as well is that it has a huge pectinase activity. And in this case, we do have a significant reduction of pectin, which in turn translates into a large increase in the uh, free-run wine, so a large increase in the yield of free-run wine. So this was much more interesting and this yeast could potentially uh, be used uh, in the wine industry. Okay, and the last chapter I will move on to is a story about protease and I see my former student over there is smiling. Uh, so we looked at, at this and this also kept us busy for about 10 years and I think it kept busy a few of my students as well. So this is a very rare enzyme activity actually because it's an enzyme that breaks down proteins and we are obviously for it to work in wine or in grape juice it needs to work at an acidic pH. And there are not so many of these enzymes that work at an acidic pH. So it's a very rare enzyme activity. But screening revealed that this yeast, which I mentioned before as well, Metchnikovia pulcherima, does possess an active enzyme, protease, that can work at an acidic pH. Why are we interested in this uh, activity? It's because sometimes when wine is stored under unfavorable conditions, especially when it is too warm, um, then you get something like this. So the wine is not clear. It doesn't affect the taste or the flavors or, or anything, the smell of the wine, but it doesn't look very nice. So we want something like this, something clear. We don't want something <coughs> hazy. And the culprit here are grapevine proteins, certain grapevine proteins. So we thought, okay, but maybe we can break them down using a protease, which is an enzyme that breaks down protein. It sounds logical. So let's go back to this story about Mechnikovia pulcherum. Um, after a lot of effort, we managed to find the gene. Um, I must tell you that it's not so easy to work on this non-saccharomyces yeast because we don't know as much as we know about Saccharomyces cerevisiae. In particular, most of their genomes have not been sequenced. We're getting there slowly but surely, but sometimes we also struggle to annotate this genome, so sometimes we have to use a little bit of older techniques to find these genes, and that's what we used here. I'm going to spare you the details, but it took us some time to get this gene. We called it MPAPR1, 
stands for Michnikovia Pukerima acid protease 1. We took this gene, expressed it in another yeast, purified the enzyme, and then characterized it. The result of this was that this enzyme is fairly compatible with winemaking conditions, so it sounds promising. You can see here, again, this halo showing the activity because it, break, it broke down the protein that's underneath here that's, that shows us uh, white. And yes, it does work, actually. If you take here, this is one of those grapevine proteins uh, that are guilty of, of making the wine hazy. It's a chitinase. And then the, the, uh, if we add our enzyme, it disappears. So it is broken down. But this was done under optimal condition for the enzymes, which are not exactly those occurring in winemaking. And if we actually shift towards conditions that actually occur during winemaking, well, it sort of works, but not quite. I mean, it's not clearly not optimal. We do see some degradation, but most of the proteins are still there. So we thought, OK, um, let's see if we can then increase or enhance the production of this enzyme. And that's recent work that we did using what we call a bioreactor here, where you can continuously feed the yeast and hope that it will evolve uh, and, and eventually produce more um, of this protease naturally. You need to apply a certain pressure for the yeast and to try and tell it what to do. And what we did is that we fed the yeast continuously for a long time with a protein. And we used hemoglobin here. So it's a bit of vampire yeast. Um, but that was just convenient. It, it's got nothing to do with wine, but this was just convenient. Um, and so this is what we did for quite some time. I think it took a few months to get there. My <laughs> postdoc is nodding. <laughs> And unfortunately, it made absolutely no difference. It happens, that's research. So at the very end, we said, OK, let's try something a little bit different. Let's see if all, this, and all these proteins that are in the cell wall, can they somehow help us here? And we tried here with four different yeast species on a, pro a protein unstable wine. And I'm not going to take you through this very complicated graph, but as you can see, it doesn't really make any difference either. So it was a very interesting study from a biological point of view. It, it told us a lot about Michnikovia pukerima, what it can do, but there are limits at what it can do. But again, that's research. So for the future, obviously, you might have seen the dates on the right-hand side. Every now and then, the, sh the project stops, and then a few years later, we find something interesting, and we will go back uh, to that project. So at the moment, we're no longer working on pectinases and proteases, but who knows? We might still go back to this. At the moment, we're shifting gear a little bit, and in considering this category of enzymes, which are glycosidases, and they're very interesting because they can liberate these kind of compounds, which smell very floral and also citrusy, and interestingly, they can also release this kind of compound, which don't smell as nice. So we are shifting gear and starting to study these enzymes uh, much more in depth now. OK, so I think you've heard me more than enough. So I'm just going to conclude. Um, obviously, as you could see, a lot has been discovered in our field of wine microbiology in the past 250 years and even in the past 20 years. Non-saccharomyces yeast, or the so-called non-conventional yeast, I told you I don't really like these expressions, but anyway, uh, they are really an incredible source of diversity, and they are, in my opinion, really worth investigating. But obviously, as for all research, the more we know, the more we realize how little we know and how much more research we have to do to know it all. And I intend to continue to explore this really extraordinary diversity between new species and continue to challenge old paradigms and still guided by curiosity uh, and interest in wine. <laughs>
And obviously, I focus mostly on more the fundamental aspects, but I mentioned a few times the relevance of winemaking. And obviously, this finding supports the wine industry in the form of new knowledge, new yeast, new, new, new um, nutrients, and so on. And this obviously to help the industry address some of the current challenges, such as climate change, competitiveness, economic and environmental sustainability, changes in drinking habits, health concerns, and so on. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge a few people. I will start uh, with the person that's probably responsible for uh, igniting my passion for wine microbiology. This was my PhD supervisor, Professor Longvaux, um, back a few years back. Um, I really want to um, acknowledge all my students um, because, as Professor Brink said, this is all about students. All my colleagues uh, at the Department of Viticulture and Enology and at the South African Grape and Wine Research Institute uh, to make sure that there is never a dull moment. This became my motto when I was the HOD. <laughs> and obviously all my funders, because without money you cannot do anything, so there's quite a few of them in no particular order. And then obviously I would like to thank uh, my family and friends, in particular my parents who are here today. Um, for supporting all my decisions, my strange decisions, and definitely putting up with my frequent indecisiveness and procrastinations. And just one word, this is my mother's birthday today, so <laughs> joyeux anniversaire, maman. I'm very happy that you're here today. And it's a big one, so it must be celebrated. Um, and all the vintners in my ancestry, because maybe I'm still carrying a few pieces of their chromosome that ignited my interest in wine. <laughs> and I will leave you with a quotation from one of my favorite French singers. I will not read it. You can just read it for yourself. And I thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, President Duval. That was wonderful. That uh, your passion came to the fore, uh, and your gift for lecturing and for inspiring your students and postgraduate students it was very clearly apparent, and I enjoyed it very much. So it's it's my pleasure to hand this certificate to you, and this means what um, we must just have people see it properly. <laughs> you, you are now a full professor, so... Now, a full professor also means that you are professing, a professor of professors. And I think what we clearly saw today was Professor Duval's gift in professing, um, the, the beauty of wine yeast biochemistry and, and also the intricacies and complexities of it. So I really want to thank you for, for bringing that to our attention and for making it available to us in our beautiful Stellenbosch location. So it's not often that I have the opportunity to speak in the presence of a knight of the order of agricultural merit. <laughs> so I should really say Professor Sir or something like that. <laughs> but uh, it, it is wonderful. I was also so I, I have to confess and to con declare somewhat a conflict here, and that is I'm a very amateur, very uh, enthusiastic wine lover myself. So it was of particular interest to me, and I was very um, pleased, uh, privileged to visit Bordeaux earlier this year, uh, where I could explore uh, some of the wineries in the Medoc and also saint Emilion region, and also visit the of unbelievably fantastic wine museum in Bordeaux. And please have a look at this on, online or in person if you ever have the opportunity. And where they have an exhibition on, I think, 12 different areas and regions in the world where uh, they make wine. And South Africa and the Cape is one of those regions. But the, the wide diversity in, in winemaking in, in the world. Um, and that has also inspired me to read a little bit more about wine. <laughs> 
uh, and wine tasting and so on. So a great book is, is by, by Bianca Bosker, who's I think a New York Times journalist, wrote a book named uh, Cork Dork. Cork Dork, and it's how the process that uh, one has to undergo uh, to become a sommelier at some, one of the top, top class restaurants and the complexities and what it really requires and the different flavors and the senses, etc. And uh, in the Bordeaux Museum, there's also a section on, on, on wine tasting and, uh, and, and really the, the, the scent, the different scents of, of, of flavors of, of wine and, the, and the, the things that come to the fore. So uh, that passion is, is quite something. I thought when you were talked about bubbling diversity, I have to, uh, about two weeks ago, I also had the opportunity to visit uh, Epernay in Champagne. So there was some bubbling, bubbling diversity <laughs> there as well. So, but I really want to thank you very much. And alors, félicitations, Professor Devaux, pour cette magnifique réalisation. Nous sommes fiers de vous et merci à vos parents pour le présence. And that is where my Google translates end. <laughs> Okay, so the other point that I just wanted to make before Professor Brink does his vote of thanks is I've been, since a young age, been loved Asterix and Obelix. All right, the Indomitable Gauls, and written by uh, um, Uderzo and Koski. And uh, the Indomitable Gauls with a chief, big, big guy, with a name, but this is an English translation, not the French translation. The big guy, the chief, is called Vital Statistics. All right? And the bard, the one who sings, is, but very badly, is called Cacophonics. And the druid, the medicine man, is called Getafix. All right? Getafix. So soon after Professor Brunk's vote of thanks, we'll be able to go and taste some wine and get a fix. <laughs> so thank you very much. So now I have to thank people that have thanked other people, um, but it remains a privilege. I want to start again by thanking Benoit's parents, um, sharing the occasion with us. It's really special, particularly so on, I believe you said, his 60th birthday. No, I'm, I'm just complimenting you. <laughs> you don't have to be that honest. Uh, also, uh, when uh, Professor Duval was acknowledging um, people when he said uh, he introduced these PhD students, I th thought he was going to say thanks to them because that's why I lost all his hair. <laughs> uh, but on a more serious note, during your presentation, you acknowledge the department and in particularly the institute. Uh, there's a lot of senior members of staff here. <clears throat> the Institute has come a long way and in the process host many postdocs like yourself and seen careers flourish and also give opportunities to big cohort of postgraduate students like yourselves um, and mentoring, mentoring uh, a, um, a large number of young scientists into successful careers. So Milani, you and the team, uh, the faculty would just like to acknowledge the example and the standards that you set and also the, the spirit of academic scholarship that you really demonstrate throughout. Um, Professor De Villiers, again, for having the rector uh, at a special occasion does make it even that more special. And last but certainly not the least, Benoit, for coming to South Africa in the first place, <laughs> for staying without overstaying your welcome. Um, Really, uh, the university is proud to have you, uh, you know, as a colleague, um, and we would really like to wish you the very best of the rest of your career. And long must you may you stay here um, in Stellenbosch. Bye, Donkey. So, so, also, Prof. De Villiers, I was wondering whether you can't arrange for. Um, Oblix to play for the Springboks. And <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to need one or two. Uh, <clears throat> but now I think it's time for the occasion in the foyer to get our get a fix.
Thank you so much, everybody. Bye, thank you. Please join us.